Hola, buenas tardes. Bienvenidos todos a la tercera conferencia de la serie Los Ecólogos de Krebs, Regulación de Poblaciones Animales. Yo soy Carlos Galindo de Leal, Director General de Comunicación de la Ciencia de la Conavio, y hoy escucharemos la charla Ecología de Pequeños Mamíferos, 60 años de estudiar ciclos de poblaciones. Charlie Krebs debería estar en el libro de Records Guinness. La charla será en inglés y la presentación en español, digo, la, va a estar también en inglés, pero vamos a tener la traducción en español en YouTube y ahí se quedará como un acervo para que todos puedan también verla. Eh, hemos hecho una página web este, específica para que puedan conocer más a los, a, a los científicos que están dando las charlas. Ahí está su biografía. Y también les pedimos que nos saluden en el Facebook, díganos de dónde nos están viendo, nos eh, eh, entusiasma mucho saber que está ahí gente de muchos estados de la República Mexicana, de muchos países, así es que por favor salúdenos, pongan sus preguntas también ahí para al final recoger algunas de ellas. Y esta serie de charlas se organiza porque la ciencia de la ecología es la base para la conservación, el manejo y la restauración de la biodiversidad. Esta serie de charlas está integrada por cuatro líderes canadienses de la ecología animal. El doctor Charlie Krebs, a quien muchos conocemos por sus excelentes libros de texto, y, y por tres de sus estudiantes, que también han sido líderes en sus campos, o son líderes en sus campos, eh, durante muchos años. Yo tuve la oportunidad de conocerlos durante mis estudios de maestría y doctorado, que inicié apenas hace 40 años, y ahora realmente es un honor y una gran oportunidad poder escucharlos. Estos dedicados investigadores han avanzado el campo de la ecología animal y se distinguen por cuatro cualidades. Son sum mentes sumamente críticas, hacen eh, experimentos en el campo, lo cual es bastante complejo. Sus proyectos son de largo plazo y están comprometidos con la investigación y con la educación. Así es que, pues, demos la bienvenida a Charlie Krebs, ahora en inglés. Welcome, everyone, to the third conference of the series Krebs Ecologies on Animal Population Regulation. Today we will hear Ecology of Small Mammals, 60 Years of Studying Population Cycles. Charlie Krebs should be on the Guinness Book of Records for such persistence. The talk will be in English, the and uh, we will upload the English version. Uh, it's already uploaded, in fact, the PowerPoint in the page that we designed for these talks. But we will do the translations, and later on they will be in our YouTube site and in, in our web page. Uh, the science of ecology is the basis for conservation, management, and restoration of biodiversity. In this series of conferences, four leading Canadian ecologists will share an overview of their research. Charlie Krebs, to whom many of you know for, from his amazing ecological methods, textbooks, and many other books that he has uh, published, and three of his former students and colleagues, which are also leaders in their fields now for many years. I had the opportunity to spend time with them during my master's and PhD work in Canada just 40 years ago. And now it is a great honor and a unique opportunity to hear them. This group of researchers are distinguished for their critical minds, their field experimentation, which is a very difficult task in ecology and for their long-term projects, but also for their commitment to research and education. They have made amazing contributions to the science of ecology. And we have created a web page on the seminars with links to the research web pages, and so that you can get to know them better. And now, well, I will introduce Dr. Charlie Krebs, is Emeritus Professor at the Department of Zoology at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. He has written over 300 scientific papers and nine or 10 books on ecology, ecological methods, and his research. And uh, you can get to know him more in the webpage that, I will, that we will be posting on the Facebook. 
And for me, it's a great honor to have him with us again. And I greatly appreciate his response to this series and his invitation to other colleagues. I'm sure that everyone will enjoy the talk. Thank you very much, Charlie. The screen is yours. No. Please uh, let us know where you come from, right on the Facebook, uh, say hello, put your questions, and uh, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Carlos. Um, can you see everything okay? Yes, everything is okay. Good. Well, thank you very much for your kind introduction. What I want to do today is give you a, a lecture that really follows my career, but tries to answer this question of uh, what happens to the small rodent um, populations. Um, now, uh, I'm going to talk largely about the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, my apologies to those of you in South America <laughs> and elsewhere, but um, my experience is largely not entirely here, and there's much work still to be done, of course, here as well as elsewhere. Um, uh, now, the, I'll talk about lemmings. There are 19 species of lemmings. These are these chaps over here. Now, all of these small mammals, their different shapes and colors, uh, could, you could hold in your hand. Okay, so that's the kind of size uh, the animal I'm talking about. There are 100 species of what we call in English voles. Uh, they're perhaps more easily understood as meadow mice. They're mostly living grasslands, not entirely. There are a whole lot of these, and they, and they certainly go down uh, into Central America. And you have similar kinds of species in uh, South America, but uh, I, I don't have the, the expertise to talk about them. So I'll talk about these little chaps. And now I want to go back to Charles Elton, who in uh, 1942 wrote uh, in his book, Voles, Mice, and Lemmings, um, the impress his impression of the instability of animal populations. And this was 70 years ago, uh, but it still was very unfamiliar to him and quite uh, uh, new to most zoologists. Um, and here's a picture of Charles Elton in his youth. Uh, uh, he was 28 years old then, and he was wool trapping. For those of you who do field work, this was a field vehicle in England in 1928. And these were his traps on the back of. And so this work goes back a long time. Uh, now, Charles Elton went to Norway in 1923 or 24 and talked to the Norwegians who knew a lot about lemming eruptions, what they called. He didn't necessarily call them cycles, but they knew that every now and then, every third, fourth, or fifth year, this Norwegian lemming would come, become very abundant and everybody would see it, and then it would more or less disappear. Uh, and it's the most colorful of all the lemmings. You can see it's a beautiful animal. Again, it's the size of an animal you can uh, hold in your hand. And many, uh, much talk has been made about it. So the background I talked a little bit about earlier uh, in my previous lecture, the balance of nature when Charles Elton was writing this in, in the, before in the 1950s, um, the balance of nature and the equilibrium paradigm were the dominant rule, if you like, of population dynamics. And yet we had this question arise right away, how can cyclic populations fit into a worldview that's considered to be an equilibrium? And then what kind of studies are needed uh, to address that. And that's the sort of thing I want to talk about today. Now, Charles Elton wrote a very influential paper about this. This must be nearly 100 years ago. So there's been a lot of work done um, in this time. Well, here, just to jump ahead a bit, here's some data from a Siberian lemming in central Siberia, the Tamir Peninsula. And this is the, the y-axis is the population abundance index. Um, uh, just a rough guess of how many are out there. But you can see here is the 40 years of uh, data. And you can see this population of lemming uh, in, North, in Siberia is certainly not anything like you would call an equilibrium population. So this is, illustrates very strongly the kind of problem uh, we are up against. And the Russians have done quite a lot of work, descriptive work on 
lemming cycles, as they're called now. So here are the two lemmings that occur in North America, uh, in the Arctic, uh, the collared lemming. Again, these are chaps you can hold in your hand, uh, the brown lemming. So, and these, if, if you like, are a paradigm of many of our, our voles, our, our meadow mice and lemmings. Um, they're active all year round. They do not, none of them hibernate. Uh, they weigh 50 to 80 grams, some a bit less, but that's again, the sort of animal you could hold in your hand. They virtually all have litter sizes around five to seven, uh, and they have uh, a gestation of 21 days. So every 21 days, they pump out a litter of five to seven babies, and then they immediately become pregnant again. And so you don't have to do the arithmetic to realize that populations can grow very rapidly. And it was only quite late that people realized they can breed under the snow. So we think the snow, if you're in the Northern hemisphere and you get buried in snow, we tend to think it's not very good, but the lemmings think it's absolutely wonderful. So we'll talk a little bit about that later. Now here, I know many of you, most of you will not have been able to go to the Canadian Arctic, which is very far away and very expensive. But here's a lemming habitat shot in the Canadian Arctic. No trees, of course. Most areas, not even shrubs up to your knees. Now, these are frost polygons. You can see this is a, a feature of frozen landscapes. And down in this area would be brown lemmings and this drier hillside. Again, the very uh, small plants uh, would be uh, um, collared lemming habitat. So the lemmings segregate in space by and large. Now, here's another shot of me out trapping. This is a cotton grass meadow with some caribou in the background. Again, no trees and you can, this is ideal habitat for the collared lemming. So these are the kind of areas we're talking about. So the lemming population problems uh, are really twofold. That is what produces cycles. And you have to realize that not all populations cycle, many of them do, but not all of them. Um, and, and so that's what I'll talk about in a moment. And the second question is what causes synchrony? Now, I will not have time to cover that very much. Synchrony is also not absolute, but the question, I can illustrate this for you very simply, that if you were studying lemmings in those pictures I just showed you, and you had a high population there, you could walk 200 to 300 kilometers in any direction, and you would also find they were at high density, that is in large geographical areas, the populations are doing the same thing, going up, coming down. And the question is, what causes that? We'll talk more about what produces cycles. Well, the mathematics has been done uh, over and over again. Um, and you can, uh, uh, many, many people uh, analyze this. Really, there are two processes that drive population cycles. So what generates a cycle mathematically is what are called density dependent processes, which we talked about briefly a couple of weeks ago, and, and delay density dependent. That is to say, you need to have something that isn't immediately changed in a population. The population has to have a memory, and when it has a memory, and we'll talk about what the memory is, when, if it has a memory, then this generates a, a time delay, a time lag in the system, which will mathematically generate a cycle. So you can describe these very elegantly with lovely mathematics, but what we really want to know is what's going on in the real world. And that is to answer this question of what biological mechanisms correspond to these density dependent and delayed responses. And that's what we'll talk about quite a little bit here. And you'll, uh, Stan Booten will talk also about this in another system and Rudy Boonstris. So you'll hear much more about these kinds of processes but now I want to stick with the small mammals, the rodents. Now in lemmings, when I started studying them, this is uh, 60 years ago, uh, they were well known to have cycles, but there was, there was very little hard data. That is to say data which we now expect if we're studying populations, we need population size and we need confidence limits and all those things. It was none of that was known back then. Uh, there were known to be three possible causes why lemmings might go up and down. The first was food shortage, the second was predation, and the third were social interactions between the individuals and the population. So three broad categories, if you like, of mechanisms. Well, the result of four years of study in the Canadian Arctic um, 
in those years long ago is that the, we had a nice lemming cycle. We had no signs of overgrazing. That is, there was no immediate obvious sign that they were short of food. Um, there was a lot of predation going on. Everything eats lemmings, as I'll show you in a moment. And there were also very strong social interactions. These are aggressive little animals. Uh, they fight for their space, as we'll talk about more later. Um, but we certainly did not see any sign of the food shortage idea. This was published long ago in science. So let me just show you the, the problem here. Here's a food, what's called a food web uh, with lemmings in green here at the center. And down here are all the plants that not all the species are enumerated, but these are the plants, which is, these are all herbivores here. In the middle, some caribou to lemmings, geese, ptarmigan. And these red species are all predators. So you can see, and they eat, most of them eat lemmings at least some time of the year. Now, some of the birds are migratory, some are not. Um, and so um, this is a food web. And if you showed, uh, this is a complicated diagram. And I keep telling everyone ecology is very complicated. So if you took this picture and you showed it to your uh, colleague in chemistry or in physics and said you wanted to understand this system, how it works, they would look at you and tell you you were crazy. You couldn't possibly understand this. It's too complicated. And that's an illustration that physics and chemistry are trivially simple compared to biology, compared to ecology. So here's a system we really want to understand is all of this. Um, in this case, centered in the tundra of northern North America on uh, lemmings. You'll hear another talk about caribou uh, later on. Um, at any rate, this is the food web we would try to understand. Well, what was unknown in the 1960s, there were a lot of unknowns uh, about food. We had little data on diets. What are these animals actually eating? Uh, and in this case, eating pl what plants they're eating, and how do the plants recover from grazing since it's such a cold environment. Um, the recovery of plants is not very rapid as it would be uh, down in Mexico or in tropical areas. And for the predators, we needed to know the dynamics of the predators. They also go up and down, but we need to know that quantitatively. We need to know what they're eating at different times of the year. And there was very little data on that in the 1960s. Social ecology, what animals do to one another in, in their social groups, and we'll talk more about this later, but there was almost nothing known in the 1960s, except that these animals are quite aggressive towards one another, um, but their social dynamics, if you like, was almost unknown. Dispersal was, uh, was known because Walt Disney, a famous movie producer, um, produced a movie, a myth of a movie, about lemmings marching off into the sea and marching off cliffs and, and committing suicide. And there's a lovely little book Dennis Chitty wrote about do lemmings commit suicide? Of course, this is complete nonsense. And you'll still see lots of reference to the fact that lemmings go and march off cliffs and that's why they go up and down. Well, they do not do that. Most of the Canadian Arctic is uh, like the pictures I showed you earlier. <laughs> there are no cliffs there. so. Anyway, this is all made up, terrible thing. Anyway, geographic synchrony, we knew very little about the frequency of it or the cause of it. So lots of unknowns, if you like. So as my career moved on, I uh, went to California in 1962 um, and started working on voles or meadow mice, if you like. There are also cycles in meadow voles. Now these animals live largely, not entirely, but mostly in the, the temperate zone of, of North America uh, and, and Europe, of course. Uh, I went to the University of California and I really wanted to study dispersal, the movement of these animals. Now it was well known already that California voles, again, they're just a little brown thing like this. California voles uh, live in grasslands of coastal California uh, and they have lovely cycles. So now here's an incredible contrast to the lemming. Here they live in an area that you would be more familiar with, the grasslands uh, of coastal California. It never snows there. It's never cold there by any reasonable measure. And uh, uh, yet they're still having population cycles. The simple question we wanted to try to answer is, can you stop a cycle 
by continuous cropping. So this you can view is treating the populations like a fishery and you're cropping it, you're taking animals out. And the, the thought was, the prediction was that if you cropped enough, you could stop this whole cycle uh, from happening. And so that's what I tried to do in this first two years in California. And um, this produced a, a strange effect. Now this work was done on a place called Tilden Park on the east side of Berkeley, central California coast. These are grasslands, these are dry uh, grasslands. So this is the summertime, these are annual grasses and they, they go to seed in the summer and they look like this. So this is a park of about 800 hectares, a, a big area. And the California vole lives in these. It eats seeds in the summer, and then of course it rains. So you get a rainy season, and all this turns lovely and green, and uh, the voles start to eat the green grass. So this is the habitat we worked in, and what we wanted to do was to um, do a removal experiment, a cropping experiment. So here's the two years of data. So we have a control population that started at low numbers, built up to a peak, and then collapsed to low numbers over the two years. And this is a removal area. What the removal was to remove all the mice, all the adult mice we caught every two weeks. So each of these red dots here is a removal event. We're taking out all of the adult mice we could catch. Now it turned out, as you could estimate with Mark recapture, that we caught about two thirds of them every two weeks. So basically we're taking two thirds of the population and removing them uh, to every two weeks. So and what happened is it slowed down the rate of increase a bit, but not very much. And they reached a very high level again, and they collapsed along with the control. And so what this showed is when you take these animals out, you take a large fraction of the population, there's very rapid recolonization. These are all unmarked mice. And even though these trapping areas are only 200 meters apart, there was never a marked mouse that moved from here to here. So these mice were all coming from somewhere else. Um, there's rapid recolonization. And what you came away with the impression that you're trying to empty the ocean with a bucket. You cannot empty it. There's so many animals out there looking for a place to settle that even though you take two thirds of them away every week, you could not stop this juggernaut of a cycle. So that was a kind of a, a disappointment, if you like. But what it showed is um, you cannot stop this cycle because of high immigration. No matter how much you crop uh, within reason, you, you cannot stop it. The cycle is there. There are an enormous number of immigrants. So these are typically young rodents, young meadow voles looking for a place to settle. They have to settle in a territory of some kind, and they're looking for a place to settle. Most of them much die, but... Um, uh, that's what you get when you try to empty out a place. So then it raises all sorts of questions. Uh, does territoriality drive dispersal? We know that all of these uh, rodents, small rodents uh, that I'm talking about here are territorial. They defend space. And we'll come back and show you illustrations of that in a moment. Uh, and, and so they try to drive out other meadow mice that come into their territory. And then the question is whether this kind of dispersal we have just seen cannot limit density. There was a really uh, interesting paper written by Bill Lidecker in 1962, raising that as a theoretical possibility. Um, so, and let me emphasize, you're having this incredible strong cycle in an area where there's no snow, there's wet winters and dry summers. And so the whole idea, which was a, a common one early on, is that you had to have snow and severe weather like we have in northern climates uh, here to get cycles. It can't possibly be, have anything to do with it because here's a cycle going on in an area of California where you don't ever see snow. But it raises all sorts of questions about rodent biology, about what limits the breeding season, how is it that determines when the rodents decide it's time to breed and when they don't? So that was a two-year study. And we, were, we came away by saying, look, you have to study uh, dispersal, movements, immigration, and immigration. You, and you may remember uh, my last talk. I said, for the most part, population 
ecologists think that immigration and emigration, the movement in and out of a population, are pretty trivial. You don't have to worry about them. So we did this experiment then over the next eight years. <clears throat> we went to Indiana University. It's in the center of the United States. There are two meadow voles, uh, meadow mice there, two species. And what we wanted to do is take the lab to the field. So we, we knew that you cannot study these cycles in the lab. The scale of it is all wrong. Um, and what we wanted to do, is, uh, however, is create a lab in the field by using enclosures. We were also interested in the idea that there might be genetic changes associated with these population fluctuations. Um, and so what we wanted to do is build some enclosures to stop immigration and emigration. So my grad students and I built three enclosures, about one hectare each, in order to have these isolates. And uh, Judy Myers, who talked to you last week, was uh, helping with this work. And so here's an aerial shot. So these are grasslands. You know, there's woodland around. There are other grasslands. So there's a totally open area. And we built these three enclosures. So they are surrounded by a fence that's about as high as your waist, about one meter high. And it's buried in the ground about one meter. And it has a lid on it so the mice can't walk up the side and walk over the top. On the other hand, it's all completely open. That is, the birds of prey can come and go. The, the, all the, the mammal predators like uh, weasels and so on can go over the fence. But the mice uh, cannot leave these uh, one hectare areas. So that is, there's no mice coming in, there's no mice going out. So we thought, well, that would be just like you would have in the lab if you had a big enough building to do this. And then we could do experiments in these enclosures. But what happened totally surprised us. Um, so we wanted to stop dispersal, and the results was what we call the fence effect, which I'll show you a picture of in a moment here. Uh, the, what happened is when you stop dispersal by putting up a fence, you don't let any uh, rodents come into the area, you don't let any leave the area, this stops population regulation. Um, the population increases to the limit set by starvation, and then they starve to death, and, and something you never see in, in the real world without doing this kind of manipulation. So this fence effect surprised us all. Um, because we were clearly interested in you know, how dispersal was, uh, what dispersal was doing. So here is a bit of a graphic thing. Here's population size now on the y-axis. And over a couple of years here, you can see the blue triangles on the bottom are the normal, shall we call them, populations. They rise from very low levels up to maybe 75 to 100 and then collapse in this three-year cycle. Uh, and here's the fence grid in red, the red circles. And so you set, put up the fence, and within a month, uh, this population is going exponential and it increases to over 400 animals per hectare, way many, many more than you ever see in the real world uh, without a fence. And then, of course, they starve here, a terrible starvation, and then they go down to very low numbers, and then they start up again. So these are our um, meadow mice, and this is the fence effect, but it's more easily seen in the photograph. But here, we did this again. Um, so here's a photo of it. This is Rudy Boonster, who will be talking to you in two weeks. Rudy, when he was a young man um, working with us. And so here's, a, a, and again, a grassland. So this is a normal grassland in the central United States. Um, this has got a high population of rodents in it. And if you are a rodent person and you crawl around down here, you can see their runways and the, they're chewing on these plants. They eat largely grasses. Uh, but this is a, a high population and that's what the grassland looks like. When you go inside the fence, which is only a few meters away, now this is what it looks like. There's nothing left. After a few months, they have eaten all of the grass. So there's nothing alive here. The only thing green are thistles, which the, the, the meadow mice will not eat. Um, so thistles are left, and these chap, poor chaps are all starving to death uh, because we have a fence around them. So the fence is disrupting normal population regulation. This is normal population regulation, a bit of damage. Clearly, they're eating the food, but they never, never turn the countryside into looking like this. 
So we replicated this fence effect several times, and this is what you get. So what does that mean? That means, again, that vole populations, meadow mice populations, do not typically over-harvest their food supply. They, they increase, certainly. They go up and they go down, but they do not destroy their food supply. And the fence effect then confirms that population regulation requires dispersal. That is, it requires the movement of individuals in and out of uh, population space. And even large enclosures like these ones that are about a hectare, even large enclosures disrupt something about social dynamics. And so you get these, these effects, the fence effect shows, it's a scale issue. And so it meant that all of the studies we were doing on, on small, uh, small areas uh, had to be looked at from a viewpoint of, um, the scale issue, and, and so again, we wrote much about that as uh, a fence effect. Okay, so let's go back, to, circle back, if you like, to the paradigms. What goes on in rodent populations? Well, the first paradigm we talked about briefly was a food paradigm. That is to say, what happens in rodent populations is because the quality and the quantity of food supply are the key things that the, the, the voles, the meadow mice, the lemmings are worried about. Well, you can test this idea quite simply uh, by adding food to natural populations. Now we have to do that outside of a fence, of course, but you find natural populations, you can feed them. And this has been done, we have done it numerous times. Many other people have done it. There have been many experiments carried out and there's absolutely no effect of adding food to the, on the population cycle. The populations go on cycling, they decline. You can add as much food as you wish and you cannot change the dynamics of the population. Uh, so adding food, uh, certainly the animals need food, there's no question about that, but if you add food, you cannot change the trajectory of the dynamics. So this whole idea, now this is not to say that food is not important, we all know that's very important, but in terms of driving changes in, in rodent numbers, um, one has to test it experimentally and in this case shows that it's not the relevant variable. The second paradigm is really the predator paradigm, and it basically looks at mortality. Mortality caused by predation that causes these cyclic fluctuations. That would be the simplest statement of it. And there are a lot of specialist mammalian predators, and these could be the key players. And this always came back, everything again is eating these, these voles, these meadow mice, just like the lemmings. Uh, many predators feeding on them. Weasels are thought to be a big effect because they're essentially specialist predators of small rodents. But also of all the owls, coyotes love to eat uh, small mammals, so it's voles like this. And so again, you've got many predators feeding on them. And so this is a very popular paradigm uh, that predators really run the show. And so how can you test it? Well, one of my former students, Savvy Lambden, and his uh, graduate student, uh, Graham, uh, did this experiment. So this is a classic removal experiment. So you want to find out what the predator is doing. Well, take the predators away. So they had an area in Scotland where they did this over uh, six years, I guess. There's a lovely cycle going up to a peak in 98, 99. And, um, and collapsing again. And so they had an area where these are all vole numbers again. These are the meadow mouse numbers per hectare um, <clears throat> on a weasel removal grid, the red dots and a control grid. Now you can see there's very little difference between those two trajectories. That is taking the weasels away, the red dots uh, did not allow these rodents to get to very high numbers. They got to essentially the same numbers as they did without weasels. Um, with weasels, the control grid uh, had weasels coming and going as all the, again, it was open to all the predators as well as owls and so on. So clearly the weasels, uh, which are thought to be the one of the key players, uh, at least in this particular cycle, in this area of southern Scotland, um, the, the weasels, uh, they certainly are eating voles, but because of this enormous reproductive rate of these small rodents, uh, they, they suffer a lot of predation, you know, but they make it up because they, they produce so many 
babies, so to speak, over time. They can breed so rapidly. And they breed, breed that's the other thing to point out, they, these animals breed much faster than their predators. So uh, over one year, if they, these guys can breed, uh, the, the voles can breed year round if they put their mind to it. But anyway, they can breed for a very long time. The weasels typically only have one or two litters in a year. Um, and so the, the rodents outbreed, so to speak, the predators. So again, this removal experiment suggested at least for this population, um, uh, uh, and uh, the, the effect of predators is uh, there's no impact of removing weasels. So now that's not going to be true everywhere. They, uh, clearly, these weasels are eating animals, but uh, and these are very difficult, hard uh, experiments to do and, and prolong, in this case, six years of work to get uh, this, these data. So the third paradigm, uh, which uh, you'll see I favor more, is so-called social paradigm. And because it's concerned with social interactions between the individual, the individual rodents in these populations. And so in a sense, you, you can look at this very uh, simple-mindedly and say, what does a, a rodent, if you were a small rodent, so to speak, what would you be worried about? Would you be worried about food supply? And the answer is no, because there's always a loss there. Would you be worried about getting eaten by a predator? Well, you'd be worried a little bit that you'd be mostly worried about social interactions because you've got to get a territory and there is a social control of reproduction, mortality and dispersal in these rodents that I'll very briefly go over. And also, as you could see from the fence effect, you could have local synchrony in population change produced by local dispersal. These animals are feeding animals out and looking for somewhere to settle. So let me say a little bit more about social paradigm. Uh, it's basically about territoriality. You know, we all know about territoriality in birds. You've got these in rodents. There's a defense of space, if you like. We need space. Uh, and within that space, there's a social control of reproduction because adults suppress juvenile maturation. They have babies, but if the babies stay on the, on the territory, they are suppressed. They don't start breeding. And so most of them do leave because they'll go outside to find a new place to live. Um, and that's what produces all this dispersal. The key process we think going on there is infanticide of juveniles by unrelated adults. And I'll show you a little bit of data on that. It is a very hard process to study uh, in the field. And yet we think it's terribly important. Uh, and it's been a lot of work now on infanticides, largely in the larger mammals like um, uh, wolves and lions and tigers and whatever. But in rodents, it is also a big, big event. And if you have this kind of social control, uh, you get the possibility of what's called kin selection. That is to say, uh, this is something that's gotten very a lot of press now in the last 30 years or so. Basically, it says you prefer your kin. So if you, again, want an oversimplified version, you look around you, and if the guy you're Talk, sitting next to is related to you, you're very nice to him or her. And, but if the guy is a stranger to you, you get aggressive. Okay, so that's an oversimplified version of kin selection. And I'll show you some data suggesting that, uh, again, it's a very important process in these things. And this is an experiment done by uh, Xavier Lambin, another student of mine in Vancouver with uh, another meadow vole, my protus Townsend I. Uh, again, these guys, I, I'm sorry to say they all look the same in these photos, and they do indeed mostly look, look the same unless you're a specialist. So now what Savvy did was a very difficult experiment. He produced populations that were more or less side by side, that is within 100 meters of each other, of, in which the social grouping was kin, that is the ones you were surrounded by, you're, you as a rodent, you're surrounded by members you were related to. And in another area right nearby, he had none kin. So how did he do that? He selected, he found these babies in their nests. They make little nests on the ground like bird nests. And he marked them all so he could find out who was their mother. Uh, and the key thing here we think is the females. We'll come back to that. So you'd know who, well, who was related to the mothers here. 
And then he did the opposite thing here. He took out all the relatives and let the immigrants come in. So he had the same density on these non-can grids, but everybody, so to speak, all of the rodents did not were not related to each other. Well, you can see if we measure the number of young wean per litter, you're getting about two and a half babies out of a litter here and only one out of the litter here. There's much higher reproductive success if you have kin around you. And uh, these are the same measures, proportion of litters weaning young, 70% of kin groups wean their young and only 30, 40% of non-kin groups. And that's what we think it's because of infanticide. What the kin do is they have nests, they have communal nests, so they have babies together uh, with their relatives in the nest. And that way you can always, so to speak, leave somebody in the nest to guard it um, from marauding guys who want to kill the babies. And, and that's all a kin selection um, and infanticide, the whole issue of infanticide. And these guys do not have that ability. There are no relatives around to defend their nest. So female relatedness has come to, I think, to be a big issue in small rodent biology. So female kin groups basically raise more juveniles because kin are more are not aggressive towards one another, whereas animals, non-kin are aggressive, very aggressive, and will often kill each other. <clears throat> well, let me just show you. Uh, this kind of works. Uh, Xavier did all this work. These females defend territory, so these uh, have radios on them. And you can, this is a grassland, a piece of the grassland, and you can see exactly where they are in the grassland. This is their territory uh, in the spring of the year. Now, uh, here are two that are related to each other, and their territories overlap, but all these other guys are unrelated. Now, if you follow those guys through the next few months, um, this is what you see on the same area. Uh, so the population increases, the related females, they share family territories. Um, and so that's, this is what produces kin groups and the kin groups have higher breeding success than these lone individuals and uh, the population rises. So you get shared space, shared territories, family territories. And this, I think, is, uh, again, a big issue. The data are very hard to get, but uh, related females uh, share space and, I think, protect each other's babies from infanticide. Well, here's a few examples of lab work. This is the collared lemming we were looking at earlier. And so these are lab um, studies where you have uh, controls, where you have a male and a female who have babies. These are the number of babies killed by in this case, males, we're just worried about male infanticide. And when the male and female are together, the babies are not killed. However, if you bring unrelated male into the cage, when the babies are one year old, about 50%, 40 to 50% of them are killed immediately by the unrelated male. What the unrelated male wants to do, so to speak, is to get the, get the female and, and impregnate her with his sperm. And, and win, and if you like, in a race for who's going to be the father of these babies. Now, you will do the same thing with one day old. When you have the related males, they don't kill anybody. And by three days old, this tends, in the lab anyway, to dis dissipate a bit, but they're still killing unrelated males, still kill 10%. Now, in the collared lemming, it turns out both males and females um, commit infanticide. So they're all both playing the same game of, uh, I want to prefer, so to speak, my own children, and I can prefer my own children by killing other people's babies. Not very nice, because these are not, so to speak, nice animals. They're not the sort of thing humans want to mimic. This is a life, if you like, in the real world for, for rodents that are highly productive infanticide. So I think, the, let me just try to pull it together a bit. Um, the, the ruling paradigm is what I call the millennium synthesis, since it came together roughly around nine, two, the year 2000. And social interactions produce cycles, and they do it by both density dependent and delayed density dependent effects on breeding success and mortality through infanticide. Predation, I think, is a secondary thing. Specialist predators, they certainly eat all these small rodents and they may help the cause of decline, certainly. 
but it's not always present. If you work in an area where predators are very few for whatever reason, uh, you still get these uh, nice cycles. So predation is there, it's, uh, but I think it's of secondary importance to social interactions. Well, uh, so then, uh, there's been a lot of work in the last 30, 35 years on rodents. And I just put a few points here that we have kind of covered as kind of a summary. Uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, where we think the winter is an awful time, population increase often occurs. Uh, and this is particularly true in lemmings under the snow. They're breeding under the snow and, and uh, increasing their populations. Um, Females defend territories, and, and sometimes males do too. And females commit in, infanticide. Males also commit infanticide. This varies a bit in different species of meadow voles. Again, many predators, they, these guys are really feeding the predators out there. And uh, so in a sense, if you're worried about conservation issues without these rodents, you know, many of these predators would simply go extinct. And the deep snow, I keep coming back to snow we get here in Canada, but the deep snow improves the winter temperature exposure. If you go down to ground level, again, many studies under the snow now, it, it's temperature may be very low above the snow, but down at ground level, it's not quite com what you'd call comfortable, but in terms of temperature, it's very uh, uh, mo mo relatively mild. So uh, the fact that it can breed under the snow doesn't surprise anyone anymore. Okay, what I want to do in the last part of this talk is to take you to the Yukon. This is Northern Canada. Uh, <clears throat> and this is the area that uh, Stan Booten will be talking about next week and Rudy Bootstra. Okay, this is the boreal forest. And this is such a contrast. I wanted to show you just one picture because it's such a contrast to what you would have in Mexico or South America or, or even in, in Europe. There's, this this area is dominated by white spruce, and virtually all of these trees are white spruce. Uh, there are three species of trees here, uh, and shrubs, you know, where you would have dozens, hundreds of species of trees. We have three. There's shrubs. Uh, there's about half a dozen, six different species of shrubs. Again, almost no biodiversity here compared to what you would expect in Mexico or, or many parts of South America or even Europe. So this is a, a boreal forest, very impoverished. Now what we wanted to do, and we have been there for the last uh, 35, 40 years, um, we did a long-term study. And I just want to show you the, some of the possible advantages of having a long-term study going on at the same time that you're doing experimental manipulations. In this area, there are three common small mammals, the redback bull up here on the on the top, um, about two thirds of the mice you catch out there are these guys. The Paramiscus manicula, the deer mouse, uh, is about 16% of the population, not that common. And there are microtis, there are four microtis species, uh, four meadow voles, if you like, four different species. And the real question we wanted to try to answer with this is the conjecture that cycles would disappear with climate change. And so we've written a paper on this, but the whole question is, again, tossed back and forth. What is going to happen to these rodent cycles in this particular case as climate is changing, which we know it is, and is changing very rapidly in northern Canada. So let's um, go and let's just look at the redback bull for the moment. And so these are going back uh, now, whatever, uh, 45 years, 47 years. And you can see this picture looks, these are the peak years in gray here. You can see the picture it looks the same as ones I've shown you earlier. Earlier, every third or fourth year, there's a peak population. Um, and uh, then in between, it goes down to very, very low numbers. So now this area, uh, let me emphasize this. We went to this area because it's, uh, I wouldn't say completely undisturbed, but 99% undisturbed. That is to say, there are virtually no people there. There's no forestry there. There's no agriculture there. We've had no fires in this area. So here is a, an ecosystem, a biome, if you like, which uh, in that part of the Yukon is really, uh, well, I hate to call it pristine. Nothing is ever pristine. Uh, but it's really undisturbed, so to speak, by many of the things that cause our problems of conservation uh, further south and in the tropics. So here's a population cycle going on. 
absolutely no sign that it's uh, disappeared. But when we look at it in more detail, we see and start to combine it with other bits of our data. So these are exactly the same data you just saw. The histograms, these the yellow and green bars are the vole density per hectare. And the arrows show you the peak years, the same diagram you just saw. And uh, what we noticed uh, only because by doing this for a very long time is that uh, there was a change of, I hate to call it a change of state, but a change in the ecosystem around the year 2000. And you can see these peak levels here in the yellow are quite a bit below all the peaks since 2000. The population cycles have gotten more, if you like, at a higher amplitude here. And this coincided exactly with the appearance in this area of the martin. The martin is a small, has a kind of like a big weasel. It's a small mammal predator. And you can see from our snow tracking, there are virtually no martin to be seen in this area until around the year 2000. And then they became the classic predator going up and down uh, with the abundance of mice and other prey. So, uh, but this is a very odd thing. And we think we interpret it this way. We haven't done the proper experiments to demonstrate this, but we think this is a period of social control that it's going back and we were 10 years before that. You have these lovely cycles. They're low, what we might call low amplitude cycles, but they're three to four year cycles. And there's that's all driven by the social factors I've talked to you about. <clears throat> Since 2000, we have a predator-prey oscillation added to this, and the in, bringing in these predators has actually increased uh, the amplitude of the cycle. Now, what's happening across this whole gradient, of course, is climate change. So the plants are growing more. Productivity is higher in this forest, even though it's far in the north. But we think somehow that adding this predator has changed the dynamics. That, uh, so I call this a period of predation plus social control, which has changed the system. So we will see how long this uh, carries on. Um, I want to say just a, a word about uh, meadow voles here, uh, just to finish off. Um, if, there are four species of meadow voles. So these, uh, now these are grassland animals in the forest I showed you has relatively little grass in it, but there's some patches. Um, and this is the density here. And, and so you can see, again, before the year 2000, there were relatively, there were three-year cycles, four-year cycles, but they were relatively modest. Since the year 2000, they become stronger. Now, the odd thing about this, which I have no explanation at all for, is we have four species of microtus, some of these small uh, metal voles, and the peaks of these cycles basically change the species. The dominant species we catch, these are a fixed grid that hasn't moved, and we do it over and over again every year, and the species change. So this year, the peak species of Microtus pensylvanicus, this year it was a mixture of pensylvanicus and echinomus. And these, these two cycles, it was myurus and echinomus. Uh, this cycle was entirely myurus. It's called the singing bowl that uh, Carlos Galindo has studied. And then we had one of my myuris and echinomus. Then we had longicaudus coming in. This is another microtus coming in with Pennsylvanicus. And then the next cycle was with echinomus and Pennsylvanicus. So no one has ever seen or described this kind of craziness where the dominant species, just like these species, even though they're good species, they're all interchangeable. So as the who's, but they all produce a peak every third or fourth year. And so there's something going on here. And I think what it is, is some kind of patch dynamics. And, and again, the scale of this, we're only studying a grid of two or three hectares. And I think we need to look at the whole landscape scale to find out where these guys come from and where they might be at a peak in one patch this year and then go down and another species gets going first and comes in and takes over for the next cycle. Anyway, so here's a problem. I don't, we don't know the answer to this. Somebody will work it out, uh, but, a, but a curious pattern. Okay, so let me just finish up. Yukon vole populations, we have this three to four year cycle. They continue, they're not disappearing. So anybody who tells you they're all disappearing, at least is wrong on this particular population. 
there's very rapid climate change, especially in winter. I haven't talked about that very much, but you can read about it in the newspapers. And there are new predators, because of this climate change, there are new predators arriving. Um, and there is some farming starting up. Um, coyotes have moved north uh, about six to 70 years ago. Weasels uh, uh, were completely disappeared almost, and then they're back now, and Martin have come back and gotten more common. So new predators are arriving, and how much this will change these bull populations, um, I don't know. Well, all of this, let me finish off by just saying that we, I have adopted a very simple approach to discover patterns. You need good data, and you need long-term data. Once you've got good data, you need to understand the mechanisms behind the pattern. So all of these mechanisms have density dependent and delay density dependent parts to them, but it's the mechanisms that we have to understand in terms of management. If we ever have a conservation issue or a management issue, all you can do is do something about the mechanisms. And to understand the mechanisms, we need good field experiments. Field experiments are hard work. Um, they have to be long-term. They take a lot of time and they take a lot of money, but it's a uh, I think, great experience to be out in the field and see how, uh, um, so to speak, uh, Mother Nature works uh, in these interesting patterns. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Charlie. Great, great talk. It's, a, it's an amazing story. And uh, I have to confess that I always thought that your seminars were just like a concert. And I confirm it today. It's really, really amazing to hear all these experiences. And as, as I mentioned earlier on, one distinct feature of, of your group of Krebs ecologists is the experimental approach and the long term. And there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that as you just showed. Uh, for example, after 10 years, you have a natural change in the community that changes, that changes things. And uh, unfortunately, most studies are very short. And also, uh, you've shown the, the importance of the heterogeneity of the landscape, you know, what's happening, where, where do they come from, and how, what is the role of the heterogeneity. I want to thank uh, many of the people that are uh, watching. We have people from Yucatan, Sinaloa, Sonora, Puebla, Veracruz, Nuevo León, Oaxaca, Aguascalientes, Estado de México, Ciudad de México, Chiapas, Jalisco, and Zacatecas. We have also people from Honduras, from Peru, from Colombia, Argentina, Italy, and from the University of Canberra, Margarita Medina says, hello, Charlie. And uh, we have a, a, few, a few questions here. And I'd like to start from one general one, which is, uh, is kind of the general public. <clears throat> uh, many, many biologists, many conservationists justify the conservation of predators with the argument that they control the prey. So most people try to defend snakes and uh, raptors and everything saying that uh, uh, we have to take care of them because they are what keeps uh, all the rodents and other nasty little things in control. <laughs> uh, what I hear from your talk is uh, might be actually the reverse. Uh, the predators may not control the prey, but the prey actually is, uh, is of high importance for the predators. Uh, what, I mean, uh, this probably is case by case, but maybe you can, Tell us a little bit about these ideas. Well, I, I think, uh, Carlos, you, you hit the nail on the head. The, the, it's the rodents that keep the predators going. The predators, uh, well, they do a little bit. And it depends on what kind of system. Some farming systems where things, if you like, are a bit out of whack could uh, have more predator effects. But I think the predators are largely just living off the backs of the rodents. Um, and so I would not, I mean, I. I think, you know, we want to, conservation, to, to me, almost, uh, I hate to call it a religious uh, element to it, but I think, you know, we have responsibility for preserving the biosphere for our children and grandchildren. And you can call that religious, you can call it just humanism, that's sensible. 
And so I think we want to certainly protect all these predators as much as we can. Um, but I, I think you know, justifying protecting them on the basis that they'll keep the rodents from devouring us, uh, so to speak, uh, that, that's really, the, the data do not do not support that. Um, okay, I have a question that is a bit related because it says, this is from Paola Correa. She says, what happens in terms of drivers when the food supply is enough, like in agricultural fields, the alfalfa crops, uh, what happens with the population dynamics of the rodents? Do they have outbreak, outbreaks too, or they don't have? Uh, well, we worked uh, um, in the early part of the, this century in Australia where they have incredible outbreaks. And if you go on the web now and look up house mice in Australia, you can get some absolutely incredible footage of house mice, which is an introduced pest. Uh, in grain fields, uh, as they harvest the grain, uh, and this is getting to this is really the end of the harvest season, and there are mice everywhere. They're unbelievable densities, and that's coming off uh, agriculture, of course, and it's uh, high productivity. Uh, so th these are cases I think uh, that have to be looked at on their own. And so, what can you do about it? Um, and again, I think the key uh, things, which okay, what the solution of all this? Agricultural pest is rats plus mice is poison. Go out and poison them. That's the dumbest thing you can do. I mean, you may have to do it, but it's so, you don't want to do that, I think. You want to understand why these animals can break out and, and get so abundant. And it's all tied up, I think, in their social structure. And yet hardly anybody looks at social structure. And why is it in some years they can breed so effectively? And I think, again, it's got to do, I suspect, with having kin, uh, kin groups, if you like, and females nesting in the same burrow that guard their young from infanticide and the population blows out. Now, it's obviously uh, uh, aided by the farming system, which produces so much excess uh, grain that, that is spilled when they're... Um, but I, I think, the, and now what you can do to stop it, I think, is a good question. And again, there's a whole history of that uh, in Australia that has not been successful at trying to get biocontrol agents, the sort of thing Judy was talking about last week. Um, you know, the biocontrol, I think, is a very difficult area. And you need to think about what you can do. Now, we have genetic methods now with CRISPR and all these fancy techniques that open the door to some possible ways of rearranging the house mouse genome or whatever, it might reduce some of these outbreaks. But uh, I, I think um, they certainly, um, <laughs> they're, they're uh, tied in with agricultural problems. We have uh, another question here that uh, is interesting. This is um, in the context of ecological conservations, can small mammals yield more valuable information than, than big mammals? And, uh, and I guess that's an interesting question. That's a very interesting question. And, uh, and you have to realize, as I should have pointed out, that we do small mammals because we sit in universities where the government tells us you have three years or two years to get your thesis done and get out of there and get a proper job sort of thing. So the, yeah, and if you say, I want to study elephants, you or you want to study caribou, which you'll hear about in a few weeks, you, you say to the student, I would love you to study elephants in Africa, but you need a million dollars and you need about 25 years to get one generation. And so that's why people are studying rodents, because it's convenient. Okay, so I think conservation is, obviously we don't want to neglect the rodents, and there are some that you really have to worry about. But uh, by and large, we'll have to worry about the larger species because they're the ones getting knocked very severely. So I think it's only natural that conservation centers on those. Now, the ones that eat uh, small mammals, of course, you have to worry, so to speak, about the small mammals not losing all of their habitat and whatever. So, um, but no, well, we've got to concentrate on the big guys, so to speak. An, an, an interesting follow-up. There is a question here 
that says, what do you think about the disruptions of populations in particular, particularly the rodent populations, but by what is being called the rodentization that it has been reported in different studies. Uh, I don't know if you've heard that term, but it's kind of the, because of the elimination precisely of predators, now uh, people are talking that there is going to be consequences because uh, small mammals also transmit diseases and are more abundant and there is no selection for sick animals. I don't know if you have heard uh, about those studies. Okay, I, I have heard this and I confess not to have investigated them very deeply. Um, I think there are a whole lot of problems with that and there are a whole lot of situations where that certainly is not occurring. Um, we certainly ha have to worry about rodents carrying disease, but uh, you know, you have to realize, uh, uh, just to give you an example that Vancouver, which is a highly sophisticated Canadian city, has rats in the downtown that have three of the most deadly diseases known to mankind and no one has, no human has ever got these, even though we have poor people sleeping on the street and whatever. So I think a lot of the things which uh, the disease worries and uh, are, are things to do with society, taking care of the poor and whatever, and housing has changed and improved. And, uh, you know, you have the same thing with uh, uh, Yersinia pestis, the Black Death, you know, the terrible things that happened 600 years ago. Uh, it's sitting in Western United States, the ground squirrels are full of this terrible thing, but it never ever gets to people. And that's because people, you know, have better housing and so on. So, uh, you know, I think you have to realize that the rodents are full in, in Southeast Asia, the cities there, again, there's lots of diseases that come off the rats in the cities and so on. So I think one has to manage those however, however you can. But in large part, you have these problems because there's too much food around, too much wasted food. These, uh, you know, rats can't live on nothing. The smell of food alone, they can't. Uh, and, and all these animals, they need food supplies. So uh, one should start with kind of first principles, I think, rather than the usual approaches to get out the poisons. Okay, well, I guess I will close with a couple of more questions. One says, um, if uh, what, how do you, um, what do you think about generalist predators and specialist predators? Maybe it's something that Stan will talk about, but the, that's one of the questions. And the other one is, um, it has to do with uh, if you think that uh, these cycles are strongly influenced by social interactions. How common would you, do you think this is in other species? Uh, well, I would, uh, the last one first, I think it's common in a whole lot of species and I would love to have, have a lifetime in South America or Mexico studying these kinds of problems there because I think even though the species are very different in the, the taxonomy, uh, I think you're gonna find the same kind of processes because uh, of evolutionary pressures. Um, now, the first part of the question, I've already forgotten, you better remind me. Generalists versus specialist predators, yes. yes. Now, that is a distinction, which uh, I, I think it, it's far too black and white. That is to say, a specialist predator eats a whole lot of things. We have uh, lynx in the Yukon now that are starving because the hares, so you'll hear about this next week, the hares are, are not abundant. And they have to, what, what can you eat? You eat anything you come across that's edible. Um, and so that's a specialist predator. It's not really a specialist predator when it, when it really gets into difficult times. So, uh, and I think the other thing that uh, is worrisome to me about the, so I, all right, if I had to decide things between specialists and predators, I say it's a continuum, it's a continuous scale. And I'm sure different animals are at different points on the scale. But the specialist predators, and, and if you look at predators in general, and I'm talking again largely about North America, I'm afraid, and you look at the diets of what the predators actually eat, you find that maybe half the year, nobody has any idea what they're eating. You know, they get data on them in the summertime when the students are out, but they don't, nobody knows what they're doing in the winter, or they get data in the winter, and it's impossible to find what they're eating in the summertime. 
And so a lot of the predators we think are specialists, I think if you could look at their whole lifespan, you would find they're not so much. So I would say when I see the word specialist and generalist, uh, you know, kind of red flags go up. <laughs> and I think, no, well, what are your data, you know? There certainly are differences of diet. I think we need much more data on that. Well, Charlie, there is also a number of congratulations. Uh, it's Celaria says, congratulations for an amazing path in science with lots of experiments that have taught us a lot about these patterns and processes. Uh, there is a lot of congratulations. People say it's a, a great talk, an amazing talk. You can see all the comments. And uh, well, I'd like to thank you again, Charlie, for this amazing talk. It's really uh, the story of Charlie Krebs. That's why we call the seminars Krebs Ecologist. And uh, the idea came from a book that was written by Charles, uh, no, not written by Charles Elton, about Charles Elton, which is called Elton's Ecologist and his influence on a large number of ecologists at the beginning of, of, the, of, of this science of population ecology. Uh, and the interesting thing is that Charles Elton was the advisor of Dennis Chitty and Dennis Chitty was the advisor of Charlie Krebs. And now Charlie Krebs has a whole generation, several generations of ecologists that are, as you can appreciate, pretty amazing in their approaches and, and all these ingredients that make for good science. Uh, thank you very much, Charlie, once, once again. And we invite everyone to see our next seminar next Thursday, which is going to be one of Charlie's students, Dr. Stan Button, who is going to talk about predator-prey dynamics in Canada's boreal forest. Uh, an amazing place, an amazing system, and we hope you all uh, come back to be in the seminars. Thank you, Charlie, and thank you, everyone. Muchas gracias a todos por estar con nosotros. Y Los esperamos la próxima semana en este mismo canal. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you.